I'm Steve Vibronix, and this is the Life in Dub podcast, talking to people who live their lives in dub and reggae. Episode number 33. Welcome to the 33rd episode of the Life in Dub podcast. I hope everyone's okay out there. I've got to say a big thanks for taking the time to listen. This is the podcast that digs deep into reggae and dub history, delivering in-depth interviews with people that live their lives through music. If you want to get in touch with any questions or just want to say hi, then you can email me, vibronix at gmail.com. It's always good to hear from people, so please get in touch. All the previous episodes are there to listen back to, so don't forget to go back over and check out any that you missed. All can be found at lifeindub.com or any of the regular podcast places like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and even YouTube. This week, I want to talk a bit about free music. Well, really about free music events. It's sad to see Notting Hill Carnival cancelled for the second year in a row, and it got me thinking about all the free music events that I've been to or played at over the years. You see, the great thing about a free event, be it a carnival, a street party, a festival, is it can introduce people to music they've never encountered before. The Leicester Caribbean Carnival really helped me show what a sound system is. Back in those free days, Abashanti's annual residency helped keep Leicester's love of all things sound system alive. And when you play at these free events, time and time again you see people shocked or stunned by music they've never heard before. Of course, most people just move on, but many people have been turned on to reggae and sound systems through encountering them by chance at a free event. I remember in particular playing at a great Fetula Music with the OBF sound system in the south of France and a huge session in Mexico in a central piazza in Mexico City. So big up to all those past, present and future sticking their necks out to put on free music events. This week, my guest is Earl 16, the legendary vocalist from Kingston, Jamaica. Yabby Yu, Dennis Brown, Michael Rose, Lee Perry, King Tubby, Studio One. If you want to find out about the heyday of Jamaican music production, you need to talk to someone who is right in the thick of it, and that's Earl 16. We also talk about Leftfield and Dread Zone and Earl's work beyond reggae, as well as his own merge record label. You're in for a treat, so enough of me. Let's get on with the interview. So, Earl 16... Welcome to the Life in Dub podcast. Yes, respect, respect, Steve Ironics, man, love respect. Nice. How, how you doing down there in London? Ah, it's cool still, you know, um, enjoying a little bit. It's not too hot today. The weather's a bit all right. What I do at the beginning of the podcast is I ask um, everybody the same question. So I ask everybody this question about like a significant track. So I was wondering if you've got a track you want to talk about that's like really kind of important to you or something that maybe kickstarted something off for you or just something that's like, you know, maybe you heard when you were young or, you know, so, some kind of important track. I don't know if you've got a track like that you want to talk about. Yeah, man. You know, when when I was growing up, you know, back in Jamaica, yeah, we all, uh, as youths, you know, we all used to idolise a virgin called Dennis Brown. Because me and Dennis Brown and a friend of mine called Roman Stewart, which is the brother of Tinga Stewart. You know, he's got he's got another musical family. He's got a lot of music. He's got Angela Stewart is also one of the Stewart's family. But we, me, Dennis and uh, Roman, we used to leave school and go singing at the bars, like he'd call it busking. We'd go singing on the street, you know, busking around the place. And Dennis used to have a tune called Concentration. Love it. A beautiful tune, man. So that was one of the tunes that kind of really, you know, brought my attention to music and all that. Because the way Dennis put that tune forward, you know, when he went to record it, I think he did it with Derek Harris. It was such an amazing, you know, the whole transformation from us walking up and down on the street and then him going into the studio because he was one of the first ones to record, you know, between all of us. You know, nice. Us. So you, you grew up with Dennis Brown then? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, we grew up, you know, really close. You know, I knew his dad, Sam Brown, and, you know, we, we you know, because Dennis would have been maybe two years older than me now, you know, had he been still alive or something, but... You know, at the time, I think I was about 13. Dennis was about, I don't know, 14, 15 or something. So, you know, we were really young at the time. And studios wasn't weren't really into recording. We just like singing, you know, hanging out on the street, singing. 
looking back a little bit further, like for when you were growing up, so when when did like what what are your sort of early recollections of music? Kind of growing up, was music around you, or because obviously you grew up in Jamaica, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, when you grow up in Jamaica, most like I tell you this now, most the most things that you can find in Jamaica is the church and the wash. So we, as you know, our parents, we all we always had to go to church and stuff. You know, like every Sunday, you know, Sunday school, three times a day, all that kind of stuff. You know, sometimes during the week. But no, I kind of really used to like, because my dad was a guitar, you know, he used to make his own guitars and stuff. He wasn't a guitarist. He was just like hanging around musicians, music and stuff. But, you know, I personally was more, I used to like, the the radio used to play a lot of American uh, R&B stuff. So I used to really, you know, was tuned into stuff like, you know, the Beatles, you know, the Shy Lights, you know, all these groups, you know, the the, the OJs, the Dennis Brown, uh, the James Brown, and all that. But one of my favorite songs was a tune called Peekaboo, which I eventually covered, you know, when I was still, you know, young and fresh. Um, it was a song I think it was by the Shy Lights or something like that, or the Stylistics, one of them groups. There was a really nice falsetto and stuff and lots of harmonies and things, you know. So, you know, I kind of, yeah, I kind of just like grew up around music. I mean, the area that I came from was an area that people like Sugar Mine lived close by, you know, Tristan Palmer, myself, you know, John Jalors lived in the same vicinity. Ken Booth lived around the corner from us, you know. So we kind of grew up around, you know, the whole, because Walton Park Road, is a place that used to have a big dance hall uh, where most sound systems would come on the weekends. We'd have, you know, all the top sounds in Jamaica. So when you were a child, you'd be aware that there was, like, dances going on in the locale? Yeah, oh, yeah, man. Listen, we used to do the stealing out, you know, try, you know, run away from, you know, try and escape from home to go to dances to listen to sound system and then try sneak back in and under them thing there, you know? I mean, if you had to describe like a sound system dance in Jamaica when you were growing up, then how, how would you describe it to someone? Well, the whole idea of that era, you know, the sound system was it's very exciting. Man. It was exciting because they would always have like a lot of DJs on a, any given sound. At that time, there wasn't a lot of singers, you know, actually singing on the sound system. But the DJs were always competitive with each other. So I, you would go to a dance like with um, Stone, uh, what's it called? Stero One or something. And then you'd see people like Luton and Stitch competing against people like Papa San. And it's like a fast, rapid lyric going each, you know, bouncing off each other. Blah, 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 blah. And you'd be thinking, you know, Man, people would be throwing bottles up in the air, beating down the fences and all them thing there, you know? So it was really like a form of, it's like an like Olympics or a cricket match or something, you know, when you go to the dance. It was, it was excitement, man. You know, and at that time, we didn't really have people, you know, firing shots in the dance because, you know, we're talking about uh, mm-hmm. early 70s, you know. Yeah, just as reggae was kind of coming through as a kind of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole sound system thing, because the reason why the sound system was so popular was the radio wouldn't play a lot of the music. A lot of music wouldn't be played at reggae, especially reggae, was not being played on the radio. Because the radio was kind of controlled by, you know, BBC and all this, you know, uh, bureaucracy business. So, the sound systems and the jukeboxes, which was like, you know, you could get the jukeboxes in the clubs or in the bars or something like that, was where people would, you know, put, you know, because we had a lot of press at that time. So records was pressing, you know, regularly. So you could hear your favorite tunes in the jukebox or you could probably go to the dance and hear like a special a dub plate mix. What would these sound systems sound like? Because obviously back in those days, people's home listening stuff was pretty basic. Like everywhere in the world, really. So, what what, and what what were these sound systems sounding like back then? Well, you see, the sound systems because they we had certain guys like there's a guy called Matador who was um, Lloyd Daly, who used to build sound system boxes for you know 
for all the, you know all, most of the sound systems. King Tabby's was a man who used to build amps for most of the sound systems. So then the guys would go get all the biggest speakers they could find. <laughs> you know what I mean? Build some big boxes looking like a house. <laughs> and then wheel them around to the dances and stuff. So, like, we had a dance, I think it was, I can't remember the exact year, but there was a dance called Death in the Arena, which was a, a clash between King Tubby's and I think it was uh, Arrows, Mighty Arrow Sound. And that was kept in the National Arena. You know, that's, the, I mean, the National Arena is like somewhere a big that's, sports kind of thing. Or... Yeah, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a you know, special place for, you know, certain kind of events and stuff, which is like international events. Well, this, these guys just wanted to see how, you know, who had the biggest, heavier sound. Because it's a big hall. So, you know, you can't escape the sound, man. Come on. So you'd hear it like it, it would be like taking over the kind of neighborhood or whatever. You can hear it miles away, Steve. So, and then we, some of, most of those sounds had like the massive steel horns. I don't know if you remember those. The good thing about a lot of the sounds, is that a lot of the sounds at that time, was the bass, the frequency of the bass was really, you know, it was phenomenal, but it was, you, you could handle it. You could handle it, you know what I mean? It wasn't too, like, distorted or anything. The only time you'd get distortion is when someone sabotaged a man's sound. Because I used to sabotage the sound is by, you know, connecting some wires, <laughs> go around the back of a box and say, this guy sounds too good, <laughs> you know, and sabotage the sound, so then the speaker starts sounding, like, really distorted. <laughs> Yeah, they think it's shy. Did, did we blow the speaker or what? You know, but yeah, you used to get that with a company. It was competitive, but it was, you know, it was good fun. And, and did you start moving with a particular sound or something? Or, you know, because it's obviously quite sort of territorial. Well, I was kind of, you see, because I kind of grew up, you know, being, you know, coming from a Christian family or, you know, like a kind of family that was strict. My family, my, you know, my parents was really strict. They didn't really want me to go dance and recording and all that. They didn't want me to go to studio, get involved in all that kind of stuff. But one of the sound systems that I used to listen to a lot was Sugar Man and Superman Promotion because he was right in my, you know, in the area, you know. And then we used to have a, a, a place called 82 Chisholm Avenue, which was like two roads away from my, my, my house where I live. And they would have dance Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right through, you know. So all, most of the sound system that used to come to 82 Chisholm Avenue, we'd stay there. I would go there like, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning. And then the guys would come in, start, you know, hanging up the speakers in the trees, you know, the, the steel on in the trees at the back of the yard, building up the boxes and stuff. So, you know, one of the sound that, I think the first sound that I ever sang on was a sound called King Sturga, you know, which was Daddy Roy sound. Because at the time I had done a tune called... Um, Slave for Prince Tony, which had a, a label. You know, Do you remember how old you were? I probably was about 15, 16, man. You know, I was pretty young. That's why they called me 16, because I kind of started moving around the whole scene from when I was young. So that tune, whenever they played it, because it was on a rhythm called Answer. Bang, bada. And that is a tune that every DJ wants to play. Like. Still to the day. Yeah, it was like one of the top rhythms for some, you know, that's like the highlight of the dance, you know, when, 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 when you hear answer rhythm, that's it, you know. It, the dance really starts, you know, wake up. So I did a tune for Prince Tony, them, I think with a guy called Jess Screw, who was a selector for Sturgo. And so Just Screw said, 16, hey, what? I've got this tune. I saw him at Tabby's one day and he said, look, I don't want you to do a dub plate on it. I want you to sing a tune on it. So I did a tune called Slave. I'm a slave, you know. So whenever he played that tune in the dances, you know, people, you know, got excited. Yo, big tune, blah, 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 you know. So then one day they were playing close to my yard and I went to the dance and they said, hey, 16, come. Here's my man, grab the mic and thing, you know. And thing, and I started singing the tune, and friends just started beating down. I was like, sure. I that I go on another place. I said, yeah, my tune, I go on good. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Those things give you so, confidence, don't they? They make you realise that you've got some kind of skill, you know, when people, you, you got, it's like affirmation, isn't it? You know what I mean? You, exactly. It's kind of like a, you know, affirmation. But that was the kind of, uh, the way that we used to promote the tune because the tune wasn't even released as it. It was just a dub plate. But you say like, you know, you just said that you would like, um, you'd met, um, certain man at like King Tubby's or whatever. So you were already hanging around these these kind of key music places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, because our kind of was the area that you know that old uh, Kingston Eleven era <laughs> is where you had so much studios like you know in the proximity of of, of, of my, my my home. You know, so there I couldn't avoid not doing it. So I'd leave school in the evenings. I'd end up in maybe Joe Gibbs Studio in my school uniform, you know what I mean? <laughs> I would end up, you know, somewhere in, in you know, one of those studios, like King Tubby's and stuff in, the, in my school uniform. So me, there's a guy called Winston McInerney mm-hmm. that we used to be in the same school. I mean, me, Michael Rose and all of us used to go to the same, one of the same um, secondary school. So, you know, Michael Rose was a little bit older than us, maybe a year or so. He lived in Waterhouse. So he told us that there's a studio around there called Tubby's that he goes to all the time, you know, he frequents all the time. He wasn't starting recording, as it? So we said, yeah. You know, and he said, yeah, man, all the big artists, them come around there, 16, you must come. You know, but Waterhouse is a kind mm-hmm. of a dangerous area, you know, like, you know, you hear all the bad things about Waterhouse, man. You don't want to be going around there after six, you know, uh, gunshots and things. So I said, oh, yeah, all right. Then. <laughs> so, so we, you know, we wanted to see what, what all the excitement was about. So we went. So we used to go around to Tubby's, you know, and then we'd see people coming down to do dub plates and Johnny Clark, Bonnie Lee, all these guys, you know, every day they were, you know. And that was what was happening at the studio. There were there were people coming and going. There were, were busy, active places, I guess. Oh, my goodness me, man. Yeah, man, definitely. Because people like um, Bonnie Lee, he would come, record a tune in the studio at one day, you know, at a certain time. And then he would take that same record, go and catch it, press it, and have it released by the, the following day. That's fresh. I'm telling you. Because the vibe in the studio was, if he heard a tune, if someone started a tune, like Johnny Clark would start a tune, none shall escape the judgment. You know, and the whole studio would be like, rotted, what a tune. Straight away, but his ears just pick up. He goes, you know what? Right, come, let's go. He would go straight down to Dynamics, cut the stamp off. After tune up by the next day. <laughs> so, what about you? I mean, how, how did you get? How, how did you get to the mic in the studio? It's like because obviously, I guess there's a lot of people that want to record. So it's like you know, it's not it's not like it's not an easy thing to to get in there. So how 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 did you get to record your first tune? That's very interesting because the first tune that I've actually recorded, I was about fourteen or something. Me and Winston McEnough. Like I said, we used to hang out, go around studios and stuff. So there was a record shop close to my house called Global International Records, which was a guy who had a speak outside his shop every morning from eight o'clock. He's blasting music, you know. People, you know, it's a record shop. So what we would do is we would um, we would go by the record shop and hang out. You know, you hear the latest tunes and stuff like that coming out. So eventually, one day, I met a virgin called Freddie McGregor at the studio. And Freddie, Freddie said, um, you're 16, we're going to the studio next week, you know. If you've got a tune, if you've, write a, if you've written a, a tune, you can come to the studio and we'll probably will record it. And you Freddie know? McGregor had already recorded. And- Freddie was more, yeah, Freddie, I mean, Freddie had yeah, he was, you know, back and forth from Studio One. You know, he had all these tunes with Studio One and all that. So I was really like, you know, really shy and thing. But, you know, you write a little tune and you think, shit, I don't know if this tune is any good. Yeah, well, what studio was it? Do you remember what studio it was? It was Harry J Studio. And Harry J Studio is really nice. It's laid back, you know, you, 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 no pressure, you know what I mean? And the engineer was a guy called Sylvan Morris. So he was really cool with me and he said, hey man, don't worry yourself, you man, just just do your thing, man, just go on the mic, man. I'll make you sound nice and thing, you know. So yeah, when I recorded that tune and you know it was a really nice little tune. And um the, the producer 
Alfonso, he said, boy, Earl, the tune sound good and thing. And I can't remember which tune Freddie recorded on the day. Because Freddie recorded the song as well. And I think Freddie as well did a backing track on my track, the track that I did called Lego Girl. Lego off of that. It's a very old tune. That's my first Trump song that I recorded though. But, you know, yeah, it was like, because Jamaica's just a small place, Steve, so... The most of the artists know each other, you know, like most of the you know musicians and stuff. We all hang out, you know, like at some point we go to the same restaurant or we go to the same, you know what I mean? We go to That's the same. it. But I guess there's there's a lot of artists there, a lot of competition. You've got quite an active industry and stuff. So it's like, I guess, but, but people obviously started to enjoy what you were doing and then you started to get more opportunities I guess and kind of things started to move more because obviously you know people know you as this like you know such a huge catalogue of music you've released and you know so many classics yeah 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 because one of the things that I really enjoyed doing as well because I had met a virgin called Yabby You Vivian Jackson and Yabby You had a group called The Prophets so it's like about four or five, you know, singers or, or, or like a group thing. So they were at King Tubby's every day. They were cooking. They, they literally lived in, in King Tubby's studio. So one other time he said to me, 16, hey, well, I want you to come and practice with you, practice some harmonies with me because one of my singers didn't turn up today and I want you to do some harmonies. We're going to go in the studio later. You know, so we'd be outside practicing to do backing vocals for Yabby You and Really unique because uh, you, you just have to work with the sound, you know, you work with the ear. It's not like you, you're learning music, you know, from a music teacher or anything yeah, like he's that. He's one of the, the greatest music producers of all time, as far as I'm concerned, you know what I mean? So, so, so to be working with people like that when they're in their heyday as well. Oh my goodness, Steve. So, you know, I kind of picked up on some of the, you know, he gave us some hints about doing harmonies, you know, you need to be making melody, you know, you need to get a nice melody that, you know, and stuff, and he would show each of us which, you know, which note is. So I kind of really got into doing backing vocals, doing working. And then I've ended up doing a couple of harmonies and some of the Yabby U tunes, and you know, that's, that's out nowadays. But, you know, I kind of, you know, took my time and, you know, I wasn't rushing, rushing it too much. But then, I mean, during the time, like early 70s, coming up to the 80s, everybody was producing records in Jamaica. You had so much producers, so much singers, you know, it was just, it was one of the most vibrant time, you know what I mean? Because you were working with Augustus Pablo as well, weren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Augustus, well, Augustus used to live because I was, I started singing in a band called Boris Gardner Band. And they lived uptown, we called it, because I lived, uh, you know, I was born in Walton Park Road, in a kind of, not ghetto, but, you know. But Augustus Pablo, um, Boris Garner, they lived like in Heavendale, you know, like uptown. So he used to tell me to come come to the rehearsals, you know, with the band. And I used to go there on a regular basis. So when we used to do that, there was, Augustus Pablo had lived close, you know, close by. And Boris used to say, look, there's a guy up the road there, you know, you guys, if you want to have a smoke, you can go out there. And man, that was the bad thing he told us to do because... Augustus just could smoke, bro. <laughs> that man, that man loved his, his, his thing. But it was some good vibes, you know. I mean, Augustus is the next, you know, unique individual as well. That yeah, really... yeah, for sure, for sure. And those recordings, amazing, amazing. So were there, were there any, like, any, any songs or tracks that came out at that time which really kind of blew up and kind of brought attention to you? Can you is, is there anything, is there one or two or three or whatever which really were like, yeah, 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 that, this has really, like, got, got you kind of well, famous? Yeah, because, I mean, I, when I did, I eventually ended up at Studio One and I did a tune called Love is a Feeling, which was... On the version of a rhythm called Fight It to the Top by the Eptones. So Love is a, that rhythm, the Eptones rhythm, was a rhythm that was being played in the dance nonstop. Da, 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 you know? So when I eventually did a cut of it and it came out, then they started playing that a lot in the sound system. So because I used to like roll around with people like Sassafras, you know, DJs, you know. I used to go follow him to dances and stuff. And so 
Sasha was so great, man. He used to uh, work on a song called Black Scorpio. And he was, he'd never done a recording either. So, you know, he would just be mashing up the dance every night mm. with lyrics and stuff. And I'd say, Sasha, how come you haven't recorded a tune? I said, let's go to the studio. And he goes, nah, man, I mean, I'm not time for them thing. I don't have time for that, man. I'm not interested in <laughs> But he was like, at the anthem, you know, every dance he went to, he's like, people would be singing his lyrics. And I'm thinking, this guy is not, he should record some tunes. But eventually the tune that kind of really cracked it for me in Jamaica was, apart from Slave, which was like a sound system, it was an like underground tune, you know? you know, it was played all the dances and stuff, was a tune called Mother To Be, which kind of went in the charts in Jamaica, like, you know, I think it went number one or something. And how, what was that like? I mean, when you, when you, you start singing and you're, you're busy and you're active and then something blows up, and it's number one, then when you're young, I mean, at any time, but I mean, what, what, what was that like for you? No, that was cool, man, because, you know, during that time now, yeah, I'd like, I was, I was working with the band, Boris Gardner Band, and, you know, then you had like so many artists coming up at that time. So we eventually started to, there was a guy called Clinton Lindsay that was living in America. He's a, he was a radio personality over there, even up to this day. Well, Clinton started taking artists to, you know, tour, on tour in the States and stuff. So I think the first tour I did was myself, Barrington Levy, because Barrington Levy was cracking at that time and he was blowing up the place, you know. So the guy, um, Clinton Lindsay, he took up, like, I think myself, Barrington and Coco T to do a tour, you know, in, in America and stuff. What, so, what was it like going to States for the first... That, that was the first time you'd been... What, first time you'd been out of Jamaica, was it? No, no, no. I've, I've, I went to Canada, like, in the 70s with, with Boris Gardner. We played some really strange, you know, club scenes and stuff, which really strange. But, yeah, no, but, you know, traveling on my own, you know, just, like, as an artist, it was amazing because, you know, all these sound men wanted dub plates and stuff and... You know, in America, they, it was really cool. It was really, really great. Well, it's interesting you talk about like live bands and stuff as well. So you, you so you, you're obviously involved in sounds and picking up the mic and the dance, or whatever, I guess. But you, you were singing like doing like stage shows with bands as well. Is that right? Yeah, man, definitely. Where definitely. would they, where would they be happening? Because I've seen so many pictures and things of, of dances, like sound system dances. But, but with the live shows, where, where would they be happening in Jamaica? Well, the live shows, we didn't really have a big festival scene at during that time in Jamaica. I think the first big festival was Reggae Sunsplash. And that was like about 1979, something like that, 78. But most of the shows was in the theatres, the actual cinemas, the live shows. So we would go around the country, you know, performing in, in, in the cinemas, you know. And the, one of the big ones was the Carib Cinema, which was in Cross Road in Kingston. So that would, every Saturday morning, they would have like a live show with a guy called Cancer Eccles was like the promoter. So Cancer Eccles would have people like Derek Harrier. He would have the, you know, the, 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 the chosen few. It was like really crazy. Big youth would, he's, he was the main man for the live shows because he was crazy on stage so but you know and I think it was Light Parks Light Parks and We The People was like one of the main bands as well so when Dennis Brown touches a stage show in Jamaica that's it you hear screaming it's like Michael Jackson turn up or something oh, what a voice what a voice he was uh, he was, and he's, he had some tunes as well he had like yeah, a catalog of songs sure. and that just amazing so but most, like I said, most of the shows was like in cinema, so we'd perform all around the country. Well, it's funny you were talking about like going to the States and a bit of travelling and stuff, and it's like, if we sort of fast forward a little bit, then what about your first trip? When, when did you come to UK? Because obviously you've been living here a long time, and we're talking about Jamaica and stuff, and you've had a huge like, life and career in UK, but like, when, when, when did you first come? I came to the UK in 1982, and we came up to do a show for the, um, the South Bank. I think it's South Bank or something like that. The Queen Elizabeth Hall. It was like, like a... Like a big posh event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like about seven artists. It had something to do with GLC, which is Greater London Council. It was an arts council thing. 
So um, I think it was the celebration of uh, the Wind Rush or something like that. But this was 1982. So there's a lot of artists on it. It was myself, Leroy Smart, uh, Anthony Johnson, uh, Jennifer Lara, E. Kamas was on it. And yet, did you all fly together? We all came on the same plane. Mate, that's a, that's a plane full of superstars there. That, listen, that plane was, yeah, there was a lot of stories about that flight. But yeah, but um, so that was when I first came and then I came. How was it? What, what did you make of it when you came to UK? What, what did you make of it? What, what was your like kind of feeling coming to UK? It was, was, was okay. It was okay because back then they had like, uh, that tune that I was talking about, the Studio One tune, The Love Is A Feeling, was being played by a lot of sounds in the UK as well. And there was a magazine that was putting up, they had a chart, like a chart thing, you know, reggae charts. I think it was called Black Echoes, Black Echo Magazine. So Black Echo Magazine had a chart and stuff. So my tune was on the chart all the time and stuff. And I was like, wow. So, but... Friends used to tell me back home in Jamaica, yeah, 16, yeah, you're bigger in England and thing, you know, <laughs> I picked me up, I'm like, really? Yeah, mommy, you're a tune on the real England, brother. <laughs> you know, so I was like, right, you know, okay. So, but when I came up to England, it was cool, man. I like, mean, a couple of guys, like, I had a friend that was in Birmingham that I knew before called Stafford Douglas, who had a sound called Mafia So Stafford, you know, he was doing, a, there was a lot of dances keeping in Birmingham as well. Birmingham was getting big with the sound system thing. You know, the whole sound system. Yeah, you got Quaker and everything. It was in like phenomenal. Wasifer and... Yeah, it was phenomenal. Phenomenal at the time, man. There was so much sounds in, in London. I couldn't believe it when I come to England. I was like, what? You guys, so much sounds? You know, because at that time, the, the whole sound system thing was kind of waning off in Jamaica, you know what I mean? There were more shows, more, more live shows, you know, festivals and stuff, you know. So then I started doing a lot of dances myself, you know. Sassafras, we did a few shows around the place. We were smart, you know, we did, you know, Barrington Levy. But then I met, I think it was my professor. I met my professor and he said, yo, Earl. I wanted to voice a tune for me, you know. So I said, yeah, man, I'm going back to Jamaica soon. And I said, yeah, man, just voice a tune for me, man. So I went to his studio, and I was studio in his house at the time, you know. And I went and voiced a tune for him, and I forgot all about it. And then I think I went back to Jamaica. But then, because we had some some shows, I think I had some shows in America, Canada. I had, I had a tour coming up in Canada, I think, 1984, with um, George Nooks. And Ja Thomas. So I went back to do that. Then 1985, now Stafford decided to do a tour with Tennessee. Who was like at his high point then, I guess. Yes, Tennessee was cane in the place all over the world, man. So <laughs> Stafford said, Earl, I want you to come back with Tennessee. I want you and Tennessee to do the tour in the UK. So I came, came back to the UK with Tennessee and did a massive tour, man, with Matthew and Fluxy Band and all that. It was unique. And then I got caught, found a girl, had babies, and yeah, just been back and forth in the UK since then, man. You know, the usual. I got married, though. I got married. I did the right thing. <laughs> I did the right thing, but, but yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've been back and forth all the time. Yeah, so it's been good. It's been and then good. obviously, right. like, you know, you've got such a sort of illustrious career in reggae and just hit after hit and all these shows and tours with all these people, but... A lot of people here will know you for the work you did in the kind of like dance music scene in the sort of, I guess, like early 90s and, you know, like Left Field and Dread Zone. And like, how, how did those things happen? And how, how did a, you know, a reggae singer from Kingston, Jamaica end up on all these kind of rave tunes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, well, to be fair, when around 1985, I think it was, 84, 85, the... UK underground scene started to be getting involved in drum and bass music. I don't know if you remember drum and bass and jungle, jungle, you know. A lot of the guys started building these really crazy rhythms, like, you know, drum, the drum beat at like 180 decibels or something. It's like hardcore and jungle and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there was a guy called um, Rebel MC. 
who was one of the main instigators for this drum and bass thing. So he started getting people like Supercat, Barrington Levy, to sing on these really fast, fast rhythms. But the rhythm was fast, but they had like the reggae bass lines doing them. You know? They had the reggae bass line. A deep, nice, you know, heavy frequency at the bottom. So that kind of wasn't really commercial. You know, it wasn't really big on the radio. Yeah, because in those days it was illegal raves and it was underground, brand new kind of music, everything like, you know, white label pressings and... White labels, man, selling from the back of your car and all that kind of stuff, you know. So they was doing these raves, but in some serious, serious venues where, you know, like out in the middle of the sticks, nowhere, you know, far from, you know, any, <laughs> any, university, you know, any, any, you know, homes and things. But these raves were massive. They were like two, 3,000 people would go in the middle of a field, just jam and bass music the whole night. <laughs> so I used to go around with Rebel MC sometimes and stuff. And then there's a guy called Paul Daly who was one of the DJs. He started DJing, you know, remixing jam and bass music, you know, remixing reggae and remix it into that kind of jungle beat kind of thing. So he was buying a lot of green sleeve records so one day he picked up a record with me on it and he called he called around I think he called my professor he called a couple of people and said hey I need Pearl 16 to um, I need his permission to remix one of his songs so it was a green sleeve tune I think called Trial and Crosses so I said yeah man you can remix it man I said you know what I could sing it better than that you know because I'm here in the, I'm in the country so I said yeah yeah, he said, all right, man, i got a studio in my yard, you know, i got a little studio in his house or something. Yeah, come over one of the days, so I went over to his place and, you know, we made a little vibe and, yeah, we did a little thing. And then a couple of weeks, a couple of months after that, they remixed it again and called it um, Release the Pressure. So that tune was like, they had a thing called the Indie Chart. At that time, that tune was number one on the indie chart for about three months. Right That's now. it, because I remember that in that time, those kind of tunes just being, yeah, huge. And because this whole rave scene had gone bananas, you know. Oh, cracky, man. The, 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 the bass was so deep and heavy on it. It was like a reggae tune, but it was still, you know, classed as a kind of techno kind of vibe. And then, you know, so, so that tune was one of the first tunes those guys I did with them, you know, in that kind of, you know, era. And then, you know, it was getting big and things, so we moved on from that, and I started working with a. I got. I, I signed a publishing deal with a company called BMG. Yeah, they're like big, big music publishers, aren't they? Yeah, and then so while I was in the process of doing that, I met those guys, Greg and them from Dredge They had a tune they wanted me to do, which was a tune called Zion Ute. Well, it wasn't called Zion Ute at the time. But I wrote a tune for them called Zion Ute. And then that, again, was the next tune that was, you know, kind of big because they had so much remixes of it so that they would remix one for radio. They had one remix for, you know, the dance, one remix for your yeah, headphones. <laughs> there was that 10 remix of that something. It kind of become really, became really, like, big in the underground as well and stuff. So, but, you know, eventually people like Arisandi got involved, you know, with Massive Attack. You know, they really, Massive Attack really loved Iris, you know, because they listened to a lot of reggae music. I mean, it was just recently, I think a week, a couple of days ago, actually, I was reading an article about Mick Jagger saying his 20 top favourite reggae songs. I was like, really? <laughs> as much as 20? <laughs> you know, I didn't really know. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are really into reggae. And a lot oh, for sure. I mean, it's like, you know, here we are now, you know, 20, 21, doing this interview. I'm a, like a lifelong reggae fan. You've been talking about growing up in Jamaica. Like the, the influence of reggae music and, and the style that you and the guys created is like, you know, it's a strong thing. Yeah, now at one point, I think about the early 80s, I was in Jamaica. Like, Gregory Hazard has a shop at a shop called African Museum in Chancellor which is Chancellor is in the heart of Kingston. The most bad man, the most gangsters. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a rough place. And out of nowhere, walking up the street, we sat, we, you know, we sat down on Chancellor one one day. Was Chris, uh, not Chris Blackwood, 
uh, the guy from Virgin, Frontline Records, what's his name, man? Richard uh, Branson. Um, yes. Richard Branson, I think it was Don Letts and the next guy called um, Johnny, Johnny Rotten or something like that. Okay, I've heard about that trip. Yeah. And these guys were walking up in their shorts, barefoot, coming up the road. I'm like, who are these guys? What are they doing right here? You know, because I think they just came out of a taxi. They was looking for Greg Reiser because they wanted to sign some album for them. And we say, yeah, boss, I'm all right. I'm thinking, you know, because, you know, we, we, we were just surprised to see, you know, white people in Kingston because white people really go to Kingston. You know what I mean? They stay in Montego Bay. Oh, oh, true, yes. You've got a lot of long haired Richard Brunson and like punk rocker John Lydon. Like a hippie. And we said, you guys all right? They said, yeah, man, we're looking for Greg Riser, man. You know, we can find Greg Riser. We said, yeah, man, come on, we carry on meet Greg because Greg around the back of the shop smoking is at the joint. And then years later, I realized that that was Richard Branson because he started, was the front line of record label mm-hmm. or something? Yeah, which like introduced so many people around the world who, to reggae with these compilations and so many albums they put out. Oh my word, man. Some really great reggae albums, man. Because he was like, you know, really into that. Like, he would take Gregor to the studio, get, you know, choose the musicians and record really quality, you know, because obviously he was spending some nice money, but he was really into that, like, you know, yeah. the whole foundation of it. A bit like Chris Blackwell as well, I mean, but Chris didn't really get into the recording as much as Richard Branson did. We're talking about recording and stuff, because obviously we've talked about a lot of the songs that you've recorded. And it's, um, I mean, and you're still songwriting and like, you know, not not everybody can write songs and lyrics and kind of, it's just something if you've, it's just what comes natural to you, you think? or Yeah, man, because like I said, you know, that like myself, Winston McEnough, Winston is a top, top, top writer. I mean, Winston has got like, as simple as it might seem, Winston's got like about 10 A levels or something like that. You know, he's, he's a very, he's like a wizard. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he's got like A levels, B levels, all kind of levels and stuff. Because Winston's a very bright person. But he was one of the guys that, the first tune, one of the tunes that we first recorded together was a tune called Malcolm X. And when we wrote Malcolm X, I didn't even know who Malcolm X was, to be honest. When Winston wrote that tune, I didn't know. We were still at school. And then Winston was like, yeah, man, this guy, I've never heard of Malcolm X 16. I was like, no. Nah. Yeah, man, I mean, a big Black Panther, you know. So eventually, we, when we went to record that song, we went to Joe Gibbs to record it. We were still, you know, at school and stuff. The guys ran us out of the studio. The man said, come out of the studio, man, and I'll go on back at school. So no, 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 we got, we got a nice tune, man. Listen to the tune. So I think one of the guys said, yeah, man, I could listen to the youth then. And so I started singing, because of my comics. Yeah. And, they, you know, they said, all right. So we went back and they recorded, they, they, you know, they got the band together when we went back. So we record, you know, like in Jamaica, we, the singer sings and the musicians sing along, play along with you. So the band are there and you're working out how it works with the chords and this and that. Because Malcolm X got a couple of little changes in it, hasn't it? It's a yeah, man, it's, it's got some chords, some bridge, some, you know, some choruses, some bridges. So, but during that time, we were recording everybody in the same, you know, same place at one time. All the musicians, us, and, you know, they work out the chords and we, you know, and then we record. So that was like one of the nice things I, I liked about live recording as well. You know, recording in the studio because all the musicians are, you know, in one place. Everybody's in one place. It's like, you know, just jamming mm-hmm. on the rhythm. So that tune was recorded. And then when it was eventually released, it was released with Dennis Brown voice. Because they said, they said we were too young to be singing such a big tune. They said, what do you know about Malcolm X? Come on, that studio. <laughs> so then Dennis Brown sang it and it went viral. It went big. And we were upset, man. It was like, damn, what well, one? You know, the man them ripped off, you know. <laughs> so we eventually went back and recorded it again for the character. Yeah, that's how that tune really. But yeah, yeah, I mean, Winston was really brilliant at writing and he I kind of learned from him as well, you know. Plus, I was gonna say, because yourself as well, I mean, you write these great songs with like, you know, and and that the, the the hook and the chorus and then the sort of discipline of writing a song, you know what I mean? It's like I suppose you know, it's, you know, because stuff. I kind of grew up around some of the, the top, top producers at the time in Jamaica, you know. I grew up around someone like Pablo, Augustus Pablo. 
who, you know, you know, literally used to live in his house. You know, I grew up amongst men like Mikey Dread, Mikey Campbell, Dread at the control. You know what I mean? He was an ex-brilliant, you know, scholar as well. You know, and he was a radio guy, but he was always writing songs. He had, he had lyrics everywhere. Every day he's writing a song. And, you know, so you kind of learn from the people that you're around, you know what I mean? Um, but did, did did you kind of make up lyrics when you were a kid and stuff as well? Is it something you've always done? Yeah, man. I, I wrote a song, didn't have a clue what I was singing about. I wrote a song called Julia. I've never met a woman called Julia. <laughs> the, the song, I just thought, yeah, Julia, she gets high. She didn't know what she was doing. And then, and then I went and sang the tune for Roy Cousins. And he's like, 16, this is a one wicked tune. I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, when you, you you make up things in your mind, you know, as kids do. Yeah, and also people don't realise they've got a skill until someone kind of points it out. Yeah, it's something, something a lot exactly. of people have said. It's like, you know, everyone's like chatting on the mic or writing, a, you know, recording music or whatever. And then you sort of start realising after a while, it's like, oh, actually, I'm quite good at this and... Yeah, and plus, you know, the environment that we grew up in as well in Jamaica, you know, there's so much things to write about, you know, because there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of contrast, you know, you, you have like a certain percent of the society that's really can afford it, and then you have a next percentage that, you know, is brasket, you know what I mean, things are dry, dire. So you, you, you have a lot of things to write about when you're in Jamaica, you know what I mean? Um, because even... We used to hang out with people like Bob Marley. I mean, Bob Bob used to travel up and down the country. Whenever he was in, in Jamaica, he would go running on the beaches. He would go to Trenchtown. You know, he would travel around and get inspiration, get vibes from people. People would come up, Bob, boy, you are so ready. You have a mother, you can you know, kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, you get inspiration from people in Jamaica. It's like, you know, Jamaica's a very, like, Vo- vo- vocal. Yeah, it seems like a very vibrant place, definitely. Vibrant and vocal. People are loud, you know, they talk loud. <laughs> Yo, walk one, Bridget! You know, you're loud. You know? So, so, you know, you kind of get a kind of different kind of vibe and different energy. Well, one other thing you've done as well is obviously you've set up your own label as well, like Merge Recordings or Merge Records, whatever it is. It's kind of what, what, what made you want to set up your own label because it's, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a task. It is, it is, it is. I mean, it wasn't an easy, easy task, like I said, but the thing about doing your own label as an artist, it's not something that every artist does, but for, for me, where I was around, like, people like Pablo, Pablo had a shop in Jamaica, and he still have it. His son is running it now, you know, in Orange Street, Rockers International Record Shop. So I used to really be up and down with Pablo every day, going to the studios, we leave the studios, we go to the pressure plant. And, and I said to Pablo, I said, Pablo, so how do you do with all the copyright and stuff? He would teach me about copyrights, you know, publishing and stuff. And I said, boy, Pablo, would I like press a tune for myself, you know? He said, boy, 16, we can't help you, you know, you find your one musician, you know what I mean? Because it was a kind of a very expensive uh, event. Yeah, for sure. You, know, yeah, a lot of you have to pay. You have to pay the bassy. You have to pay the guitar. You know, you have to pay the musicians. You have to pay the studio time. You have to do the time. So what I did, when I, you know, back in Jamaica, me and my school friends we all put our little lunch money together, <laughs> right? And then we found some musicians because there was a brethren of ours called Dalton Brownie. Um, there's an ex called, called uh, Albert Malawi who was the drummer, and then there was a guy called Steely from Steely and Creepy. Mm-hmm. So the first tune Steely ever played on, we said, Steely, look, we don't have no money in a brother, but we got to look at tune. So we said, yeah, come in. Because he was playing piano up and down all over the place. And, you know. He said, yeah, man, would I love to look at him coming. Never go in a studio yet. So, so we went to Harry J. We had, I don't know, like $100 in our pocket. <laughs> so, Harry, this is where we want to look at him. So we recorded a tune, I think it was called um, Man Making Plans. That's the first tune I recorded. And we recorded it. They helped us out, mix it and stuff. Man, when we heard how much it cost to do a stamper, we started scratching our head. We said, oh my goodness, me. there's more money to spend. So eventually, you know, we went around and we, you know, scrimp and scrape. And so that was the first tune I put out, you know, did the label then. I think we only managed to press 150. And then a guy called Junior English, 
bought a hundred copies straight away it was like oh my god <laughs> yeah, suddenly you got some money back in at last yeah straight the guy he came from England he was buying records and he said yeah my life man I got you I know you that buck took a hundred copies I was like oh my goodness it's going to say time, time to make some more records yeah I went back with the same guys we went back now this time we went to Lee Perry studio to record a tune called Freedom that one of my mates had written as well Clive Jeffrey so I said, Mr. Perry boy, we're kind of shot, you know, we're not having the money. But without, he said, look, I don't rent my studio, man. My studio is my own personal music. I don't rent it. It's not like dynamics or anything. So I said, boy, I'm Mr. Perry. Yeah, man, what you know? So anyway, he said, record the tune. Look at me. When he heard the tune, it was a tune called Freedom. He said, man, love that tune, I would. So I said, boy, I'm Mr. Perry, you're going to have to help us out now because we ain't got no money for stampers. We're on press it. He said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'll deal with it for now. You know, so we kind of started building up. I started building up from that. The Hustler. And that was recorded at Black Ark. I and mean, you're talking about Black Ark Studio. Yeah, it was recorded at Black Ark Studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what, what was it like at Black Ark? I mean... Oh, wow, man. That was a next... That was a journey into... <laughs> into <laughs> I mean, now, because the Black Ark, there was always some unique artists coming around there. You know, you had... There's a guy come called Bernie Ruggs mm-hmm. that used to sing for Third World, you know? He passed away now. Well, Bonnie Ruggs, I think it was Ricky Clark or something, his name. he just came from America and he was at uh, that studio every day building tunes. He had a voice like an angel, man. I used to just sit and watch the man singing. I was like, who the hell is this boy? <laughs> you know, because Mr. Perry was working him, man. It's like, come on, buddy, man. You have to get back in the Jamaica field. Get back in the field of Jamaica, man. You know what I mean? Because he just came back from America and, you know, he was, you know. So he was working on a lot of heavy dubs, rhythms and stuff. All so. these people that you've like, you know, sort of name checked so many, like, or just, you know, I've got my record collection behind me and, you know, all of those people are on all these records and it's like to be around that kind of schooling of like... It's you know, like a university, man. I'm telling you, it was like a university for me at the time. So, you know, you had to be a dumbass not to be able to grasp a few you know, pointers from them guys, you know what I mean? I was going to say, because like bringing it up to sort of... to. Uh, the you know to what's going on now i mean obviously you're still active and busy and whatever and like still so what 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 kind of stuff what what are, we, what are you working on at the moment and what what's going to be what are we going to be seeing over the coming months well currently i've just recorded um uh some songs with joe from uh, joe Aria, which is son of new appraiser i've just recorded a song for him called hold me baby which is like a cover song but on my thing now i'm just compiling an album called The Early Years, which is like going to be songs that I recorded back in the 70s, you know, coming up to the 80s and stuff. So that's that's, that's my next project on my Merge album. I don't know when it's going to come out because we, we're about to go mastering it now, but I'm hearing that you can't get back records from the press till maybe next year, 2022. Oh, mate, it's just taken forever. It's taken forever. You've got to plan years ahead now. I think I'm going to have to join the queue because, you know, I kind of need to have, I haven't put out anything for a while, you know, I mean, I used to, my last single I put out was called Love Without Feeling, which was, you know, on my merge label, a seven inch, which did really good, really well. Nice. And stuff, you know, and I just, funny enough, I just had a few pings on my band camp this morning as well, so. That's all good, but... Yeah, that's what we want to see. <laughs> yeah, that's what I love to see. You know what I mean, Steve? So, but, yeah, man, it's, it's all good. I mean, at the moment, the vinyl for reggae, I think we're kind of struggling to get vinyls because all the major companies have jumped onto the vinyl scene now. They're totally. back. Yeah, they're, 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 they're thinking, that vinyl is back again. So they're pressing, like, thousands and thousands of songs on vinyl now. So as I sort of get towards the end of the interview is um, I've got a question I always like to ask people at the end, um, which is this question, like what my book of dub question. So I've got this book, gets bigger every every week, every new time I do an interview, and I'm writing everyone's name in it, and I just ask each guest what they'd want written next to their name. So if I write L16 in my book of dub, what, what would you want written next to it, something to be associated with? Oh, man, just just a messenger of Rastafari. Rastafari messenger. Messenger of Jai, you know? Because the, 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 the ultimate uh, goal for us as Rastafarians, because I'm a Rastaman, is, you know, to kind of unite the world, you know, unity, you know, equality for all, you know. And, you know, just, just peace and, and, and love. You know, instead of war 
and pandemic and viruses. <laughs> you know what I mean? We just, we just, we just would like, you know, to have a peaceful, you know, humanity. Because nice. the Rastafari thing is something that's been constant throughout your work, isn't it? There's stuff that, the music I know and, you know, since I met you and obviously long time before. I mean, majority of my friends, majority of my friends, I'm, you know, associates or Rastafarians, like even, you know, I've got a friend called Boom Donovan who is like, he's a Nyabingi, you know, they keep Nyabingi meetings all over Jamaica. And, you know, seven days bingy, which is just drums and, and chanting and stuff, you know. And, you know, so I kind of grew up around that kind of vibe as well, you know, just going into the hills and chanting our drums. And, you know, majority of the, the singers used to be like that, you know, Yabby You was like that, that's just Pablo and stuff, you know. So we kind of like, you know, just just chant Babylon, you know, chant, chant, chant peace and love in Babylon, you know. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear it. We'd love to hear it, and so we look forward to more recordings. And we need to do another track as well. Oh, you know that chapter a day, the last one we did. Love it. You know, um, and you know, I can't forget Michael Prophet, man. That tune that he did with him, man. The, the searching for Jar. Searching for Jar. What a tune was, mad, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. That tune was amazing. I was like, oh, wow, Prophet is is back in touch again, back in play. Oh man, I mean that's just yeah. What 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 a voice and what what a character oh, wow. and like, yeah. what an artist and <laughs> great brother, man, great brother. You yeah. know, so so yeah, man, it's good, Steve. Nice. You know, for man like you who, who who support the music, the reggae, and you know support the thing. It's you know it's a pleasure for me to do this podcast with you, man. It's a big pleasure. Nice. nice. Well, well, uh, thanks so much for joining me. It's been just nice a great, time, great, great interview. Excellent, sir. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot for that, Steve, man. And take care. Thanks for joining me and Earl for this 33rd episode of the Life in Dub podcast. Don't forget to tell your friends about the podcast and to help get these amazing life stories out to more and more people. Remember, if you want to get in touch, you can email me at vibronics at gmail.com. And if you want to find out more about the podcast or listen back to other episodes or follow links through about where to listen, just go to lifeindub.com. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you all again in two weeks for the next Life in Dub podcast. <laughs>